I'm going to reflect a little bit on the secularism debate that took place this morning um, from the point of view of Women Against Fundamentalism, which I was um, a founder member of and uh, I'm still active in, and then talk a little bit about debates in international law and also what's happening in the development field where um, uh, parallel legal systems are being spread, uh, not least by um, uh, you know, uh, British development agencies. Uh, so, and I think these are all huge threats to our, uh, not only to our society here, but, but, but they are a specific British threat to societies abroad. And uh, link that up with um, the issue of the cuts, which I'm sure are occupying a lot of our minds and which we're going to have to deal with, um, well, we're, we're going to, I hope, we'll be demonstrating against on the 26th of March. <laughs> so, um, Women Against Fundamentalism uh, was founded uh, with the knowledge that Britain isn't actually a secular state. It was founded partly to um, uh, campaign for uh, the dis disestablishment of the Church of England, so the separation of church and state in England, because Britain formally is... Um, uh, a Christian state and the fact of it being a Christian state has been uh, the reason that a lot of fundamentalists have used uh, to uh, make uh, what we could call catch-up demands. So they've, they've made equality demands because there is an established structure of Christians taking part in legislation, uh, you know, bishops sit in the House of Lords, um, uh, there, there are a huge number of state-funded Christian schools and um, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of state provision for Christianity, uh, both Church of England and Catholic. And um, Muslim demands and Sikh demands and a few Hindu demands and so on, and, and Jewish schools came in the wake of uh, demands as equality demands. In other words, the uh, form of equality in Britain was uh, to make other religions as equal as Christianity. And I think that that is one of the reasons why we really have to argue for uh, maintaining not only the secular spaces, we have a very secularized society in many ways in Britain, but to, but to make um, Britain a secular state, as of course the secular society has uh, long, long done. Um, but when we began to look at this, and women and women against fundamentalism came from all parts of the world, um, what we found was that the secularism that, we, the, you know, as we saw this morning, there are many different um, definitions of secularism. And most forms of secularism have some problem or other relating to women's rights. So you have the definition of the um, universal citizen that we got this morning uh, of secularism. And that can have a problem in relation to both minority rights and women's rights because where there are specific forms of discrimination, those may be eroded or uh, wiped out by the idea that we are all common citizens. And I'm, I'm not criticizing the idea of common citizenship. I think it's one of the most po powerful ideas that we can bring to the table of discussion in a discussion around secularism. But as um, one of the speakers pointed out, the secularism is a precondition for other demands around feminism and so on. It, it, isn't, it doesn't by itself guarantee anything because both authoritarian states and non-authoritarian authoritarian states are secular, they may or may not be racist, and so on. And indeed, we see racist movements arising in the name of secularism as well, and we have to oppose those. So we have a very complicated task. But among those tasks, there is also the issue of the, the other kind of secularism, which is um, equal respect for religions, which is uh, more, as it were, the Indian version of secularism. And that form <coughs> inherits from, particularly from British colonial law, the idea that um, the state may be secular and certain place, you know, space may be secular as in, as in respectful of all religions or welcoming of all religions or even non-religious, but family, the family is not. And family law is religious law in virtually every ex-British colony. And in, in some French col ex-French colonies as well, they had civil codes, but they had running alongside them religious codes as well. And so we find that secularism in many countries stops at the door of the family. And in fact, my friend Sohail Varaich, who is um, a male feminist and has been active in Pakistan for many years on women's issues, 
uh, said, because he, he did a paper for me when I was at Amnesty International along with Cassandra Bolchin, uh, who um, uh, work, <clears throat> is chair of the Muslim Women's Network and, and works for a global justice uh, and equality um, organization on, on Muslim family law called Musawa. Uh, they did a paper in which uh, they showed that where, uh, I, I mean, Suhail, Suhail's expression was that where if you want to look at discrimination in a society, look at the schedule of protections in the Constitution. This is the paradox of law that we have uh, in relation to secularism and equality, which is that where certain groups are protected in the Constitution, for instance, as indigenous groups or minority religious groups, um, that law is not a, a subjected to equality demands. So in other words, it's exempted from having to be equal. And where all religious law, I mean, where all civil law, family law is religious anyway, all of it is virtually exempted from equality demands. Nevertheless, because you will find people arguing that, that religious laws have reformed in many countries, and they have indeed reformed in many countries, but where do they reform? They reform only in the majority law. And my examples are mainly drawn from South Asia because that's the, the, the context I know best. They reform where there are movements for reform by the people who are in the majority. So for instance, in India, you had a reform of Hindu law, which is a Hindu code bill in the 1950s. And I want you to note that many of these reforms came before second wave feminism. They, they, they pre-existed second wave feminism. They were based on anti-colonial, movements of women who had demanded their rights and often been disappointed by the national state, but nevertheless, looking at what fundamentalists have done to the state, as in Iran, we have to acknowledge that period, whether in Egypt or in Turkey or Iran or um, in all, all across South Asia, as movements where the modernization of the state meant not so much restriction of women, but a partial modernization uh, and, and, and a partial moving towards equality. So you have Hindu law reforming in India, you have Muslim law reforming in Pakistan, and being at that time one of the more advanced family codes. And it went steadily backwards after that because penal law brought in stoning and so on. It never got carried out in Pakistan because there were huge movements against it, but it brought in stoning punishments, amputation punishments, apostasy, blasphemy, and so on. Um, but you have these movements for reform in certain circumstances where even if the state isn't secular, there's a secularization of society, and that's absolutely crucial. Now, when you get to international law, you actually find that there is very, very little uh, room for supporting secularism under international law. And I think this is one of the big problems for those of us who want to argue for secularism. I very strongly say to all of us as a thing that we need to take forward is that as secularists, we need to mobilize in international spaces, just as we were talking about in the morning uh, with um, uh, around Europe, a secular campaign in Europe, because what's going on in spaces like the Human Rights Council, and I would say that you know the choices to walk away from these spaces is utterly, um, utterly tainted spaces where governments are able to uh, really undermine even the idea or integrity of human rights, or you stay in them and take up these fights on issues of cultural values on the attempt to make a kind of secular blasphemy law under defamation of religion um, and uh, many other issues like that. Now what happens with international law is that you have, for instance, before the Human Rights Committee, one of the expert committees that monitors um, uh, uh, you know, one of the conventions, um, you get individual women, probably Islamists, we don't know too much about them because you don't really know their background, who will present themselves to the council, to the committee, with a demand for protection from the state. So, for instance, on the issue of uh, veiling or something like this. So the issue becomes um, that of an autocratic state defending its state policies against the rights of the individual. And what you don't hear from is the rights of other individuals and whether the state is actually acting to protect individuals' rights or not. And of course, many of these states are not protecting anybody's rights as in Uzbekistan or Tajikistan or other states like that. They're not particularly rights-based or protective states anyway. But what we have is that the cases often fall because the state is incapable of defending their positions as a position that's consistent with human rights law. And, um, uh, and, and, they, and if they do succeed, and sometimes they have succeeded in the European court, they succeed 
quite often under something called a margin of appreciation. That is, that states are allowed, and this is against the public and the private and the international spheres, if you like, states are allowed to make their own policies with regard to religion. So for instance, years ago, a blasphemy case that was brought, um, uh, somebody charging that they should be allowed to uh, publish work without censorship from Britain uh, failed in the European court because uh, the state was given a margin of appreciation. It has a blasphemy law, it was allowed to uphold it. Uh, it's a long time since I looked that up, but that was a very unfortunate case. On the other hand, Turkey was allowed to keep its headscarf policy um, on this same margin of appreciation, even though many people would argue that it, it, it was, um, uh, you know, uh, unnecessary at a time when uh, women are adult. Okay, finally I want to um, say that um, many of these policies uh, that are uh, many of the kinds of groups that are pushing for the spread of uh, parallel legal systems such as the informal Sharia councils in Britain are being promoted abroad by DFID, that is the British Development Organization, by the UNDP, uh, the UN Development um, Organization, and other groups to promote parallel legal systems in other countries, usually in post-conflict countries, uh, but, but in many other contexts as well, uh, Pakistan and India and so on as well. And they are being promoted at the same time as courts are being freed up in order to regulate banks. In order to have deregulation, allow you know, companies to do what they like, you have to actually have quite a lot of regulation, financial regulations. So you have to have law that is enforceable in the courts. And basically, family law and my, what's called minor criminal matters, in other words, virtually anything that, that might affect a woman. So it could be rape, it could be adultery charges, it could be all sorts of things, or virtually anything from inheritance to adultery that would affect women is being pushed into uh, local courts or parallel legal courts by Western governments through the UN. This is an enormously frightening situation uh, because it is, an, it is a recognition by the UN that equality rights don't matter and the rights of women don't matter and the rights of minorities within minorities, uh, you know, within, within different groups don't matter. Uh, but they need to do this because they need to discipline states in terms of, um, uh, in terms of regulating other forms of contract law. And that's where we get to the cuts, and sorry, I've run over time a bit, but, but this matters because in the big society, it is going to be religious providers that provide. And they're going to do it, as Mar Mariam said this morning, under the excuse that there it will be the bodies that will scrutinize them and will regulate them. And frankly, this is a nonsense, and we have to campaign against it. We have to campaign against the cuts, and we have to campaign against the space that they are going to create for more and more religious regulation in our lives.